This podcast is supported by Area 9 Lyceum. Cut training time in half, create higher proficiency, leave no learner behind and improve business outcomes with Area 9's AI-driven adaptive learning technology. The platform Area 9 Rapsode is grounded in scientific research, serving more than 30 million learners across hundreds of subject areas, gathering billions of data points. Whether your focus is K-12, post-secondary, vocational training, graduate school professional development or lifelong learning, experience adaptive learning for yourself at area9lyceum.com slash learning hack. That's area9lyceum.com slash learning hack. Welcome to Hacking Ukraine, a learning hack special. Over three episodes, we tell the story of what happened when John Helmer hitched a ride with Andy Wooler, chair of Ukraine Fundraiser 2022, to help deliver humanitarian aid to recently bombed Lviv. Episode three, coming home. Previously on Hack in Ukraine. A two and a half thousand mile road trip to Ukraine began in Upfield, UK, where Andy Wooler had a band practice. From there, we crossed the channel to Dunkirk, motoring non stop through France, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Poland, and finally to Lviv in Ukraine. With a military hospital there, we delivered our payload, took a brief look around the city, then headed back the way we had come. Having spent most of the night getting through the border, we're now in Poland. After a short nap and a nourishing breakfast of Egg McMuffin, we forge onward. I've never been to Poland, and it was dark when we passed through on the way out, so I get to see some of it on the light for the first time. As much as you can see from the motorway. What I see, apart from container lorries, is forest and lakes and several motorcycle gangs, including a chapter of Hell's Angels, on their way at a guest to the Car Patch Custom Bike Show held in southwestern Poland close to the Czech border. Well, it's not a sightseeing trip. What it is, I'm beginning to realise, is a test of endurance. Less for me than for Andy, who's doing all the driving. But in this next clip, recorded somewhere near Kassel in Germany, you can hear the barrelling non-stop there and back with minimal brakes for naps in the van is beginning to take a toll on both of us. OK, so it's 10.30 on... I don't know what day it is. Can you, Andy? Uh, I believe it Friday. might be Friday. Yes. Friday. Yeah, I think, fuck, it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, 10.30 Friday. Um, we're on the way back. Uh, we're just outside Castle. Um, probably a bit less further on than we'd hoped. Aiming to get an 8 o'clock ferry now from um, Dunkirk to Dover and then we'll be home tomorrow which would be great but um, I'm I'm absolutely knackered I mean we haven't had any real sleep to speak of the last since when did we come? Monday? Tuesday? Uh, Tuesday, Tuesday evening we left yeah, yeah we've had naps and I think the longest we had is what four hours? Yeah we had four hours that delightful four hours when I managed to inflate the bed in the back of the van yeah. Which was nice. But all in the van. No hotels were, were got anywhere near during this. Um, so uh, I, I feel absolutely on the floor. And all I've done is sit in the van. Um, but you've been driving, Andy. And um, I can tell you're pretty shattered. How do you feel, man? Yeah, shattered is probably a very good way to describe it. It's, um, yeah, I'm absolutely... Um, Broken, I think, probably. Um, nothing that a, a sleep won't put right, but uh, um, we have pushed the limits on this one in terms of how far we've driven um, on how little sleep. Um, uh, and that was that was a choice. That was a choice to come without a second uh, driver. Um, because that's, what, that's the difference when I have to do it all myself. It's a bit brutal and I... And I'm fully aware of that, but uh, but uh, on the way back, of course, we can take it easy. Um, I find, interestingly, power naps very helpful, and uh, uh, I had a 15-minute one earlier, if you recall, and felt incredibly refreshed 
for about 10 minutes after we woke up. Yeah. Uh, well, for a short while, and that's kept me going. But yeah. So the power it's, of the afternoon yeah. nap, for, you know, is, um, I know has been spoken about recently on LinkedIn, about let, let your co-workers go and have a 40 winks in the afternoon. Yeah. But if you're just having naps and no proper... I mean, it takes a toll, doesn't it? Why do you do this to yourself, really? I do it because when you meet the people uh, and you see how grateful they are um, for the help that's being given to them. And when we were in the little bit this morning, you saw for yourself the guy in the wheelchair. Was that this with... morning? Yes, it was. not Was it? You're joking. I'm Is not it? sure. It might have been this morning. Yeah. Yes, it was. Yeah, we're in we were still in customs this morning, weren't we? Getting out oh, maybe it. it was yesterday. Sorry, it was yesterday, yeah. yes. Sorry, we, we've also been totally proving the work of Mr. Ebbinghaus during the course of the last <laughs> three days. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, but, I mean, you saw for yourself, there was a guy who came by the side of the van in a wheelchair with no legs, um, and yet a 100 yards from him were the two electric wheelchairs we had just delivered. So a very direct relationship yeah. between... Uh, what we've taken out there and, and where it's going to be used and there's nothing better and and the people who donate the aid to us as well have been incredibly kind in their comments on Facebook during the course of the day you know they call one of them called me a superhero I'm not you know all, all, all we do is we are a logistics element of, the, of an end-to-end -end process it involves many different players all of whom play their part Sadly, from my perspective, the only one who, who's not a better, in better sleep out of all those players is me. Right yeah. at the moment, that's the way it is. You know, I, I've come into this knowing that. That's... But the fact that you know we've got two sixty-seven-year-old uh, gentlemen uh, doing this run in a short space of time, um, some people will say it's bloody ludicrous that um, we've actually done it. Um, but, you know, if we don't do it, does it get done, you know? Yeah. And there's lots of small teams like, like ours that uh, go out there doing things. <clears throat> You've seen a few of their vehicles when we were driving around a little bit today and, and, and so on. Um, and it's not just about the aid, because uh, we had this conversation earlier where you said, well, why don't you just ship it by air freight? Um, yeah. Well, apart from the cost, um, the logistics of getting it from the airport into the country remain. But yeah. the real big thing is that, that this is a huge morale boost for the people as well um, to see the piece of care. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you spotted, but earlier on today, we, we were overtaken by a red van with Ukrainian plates on um, twice. Uh, he must have stopped and then overtake us again. Um, and he put his four-way flashes on as a sort of thank you as yeah. he went past the van. Yeah, he's probably asleep at that point. <laughs> and that's not unusual, you know, that happens quite a lot because they, they, uh, they really do appreciate it. Yeah. And, and that's what makes it worthwhile, you know, the look on the kids' faces at last Christmas when, when they were opening Christmas well, presents yeah. in Kiev, some of which had been on our van the day before. Yeah. You know, that makes it uh, really worthwhile. The lady who looks after disabled children, um, you know, always gives me an enormous hug when I see her there. There's a thank you for, you know, the, what she needs to help look after these poor kids. Yeah. yeah it's nice. No, that's, that's the benefit of, of all of this. Um, and I don't ask or expect anything more than that, to be honest. Yeah. It has to be sustainable. You've got to look after yourself. So, you know, I can see, totally see the logic, having mm. seen the operation now, um, most of the way through, and all that is to keep the costs down, and that involves a certain amount of privations to the the people who are actually doing it. But, um, so but if you drive yourself into the ground. It's one of the reasons we only go once a month, not twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, you've seen that just now when I was checking out the, the ferries back because we, we, we can never book the home ferry before we leave because we yeah. just don't know. Um, you know, we could have caught a ferry at six o'clock um, if we can make it there for six, but it was £70 more. Mm. Um, 
the reality is we're now on an eight o'clock ferry. If we happen to be there at quarter to six, my guess is DF DFDS will shove us on there. Yeah. And we've saved 70 pounds. So you know what this is leading to, folks? You know what the answer is to, to this conundrum? To Andy knocking himself out to make this happen. Give us the fucking money. That's very adjacent to uh, to Bob Geldorf. Um, I think it's pretty good, actually. Yeah, is it? Right. wasn't so bad. It it's wasn't the feckin' money. Yeah. No, I've moved it there. I think I've gone a bit... <laughs> um, it is incredibly important because... Got a bit Paul McVaney there. <laughs> because everything we do um, is self-funded. Nobody's paid in our organisation in common with a lot of similar NGOs. Um, if we haven't got the money to put the diesel in the tank, then we land up doing it. And I know Mike has put a lot of money in over the, since last March, as I have done since um, I joined in December. You know, little things like the van we're in, um, I, I paid for that, that's my van. Um, I, <laughs> I covered the cost of getting it roadworthy. Um, I've insured it for the first year of taxes and all the rest of it. Um, if I hadn't have done that, we would still be running with one van. Uh, but you know, I, I've done that willingly and gladly to do that. But that's just an example of where, <clears throat> you know, everything we do has to be funded by somebody. And yeah. if the public don't do it, we land up doing it ourselves. And that's a rocky road for, for some of the members of the team who yeah. uh, don't have the benefit of a uh, salary at the lo level perhaps that I do um, currently, although I'm reducing my hours. And um, the day will come when I'm fully retired, I'll be equally as stingy about these things. But, yeah. So every bit of money that you today comes in, and of course, um, we're very grateful for all the donations that have come in during the time we've been posting on Facebook and so on, and hopefully those will continue to come in as I start to release the podcast. Oh, absolutely. Thank you to all of those listening who have donated, and to all of you who are just about to. I know you are. You know you are. Just need to get around to doing it. Really huge, heartfelt thanks from us um, on behalf of the Ukrainian people um, and a big thanks to John for the exposure to our work that this journey has enabled. Um, as, as you will discover when you listen to the eventual podcast, this isn't just about taking aid to Ukraine. We've had lots of other very insightful and interesting conversations that relate to our shared day job interests. Yeah. Um, but the byproduct for me is that this has enabled us both to expose to a very wide audience exactly what goes on um, in an organisation like ours. And, that, and I know, <laughs> talking to John out without the tape recorder on, but <laughs> this has been an eye opener in terms of, you know, and this is just a quick in and out trip, you know, you can imagine if we go to Kiev and we go down from there to, to Zaporizhia which, uh, or somewhere like that, and we're planning to do something like on those lines in September, you multiply all of what you've seen um, by a, a huge magnitude um, and I think you really have a much better understanding of that now um, and even just a quick in and out, we're dead, the pair of us, you know. When, when this tape goes off, we're going to be opening and putting the van in the car park. Um, I'm going on the airbed in the back, which we couldn't do on the way out because, of course, the van's full of aid. Yeah. And John wins the, uh, the front seat. Yeah. I think it's time to do that, to get your head down, prepare for the, for the last leg. So, close out there. Thanks, Andy. Absolutely. Since Ukraine Fundraiser 2022 formed at the start of the Russian invasion, the organisation has made more than 18 runs to Kyiv, the Donetsk region, Zaporizhia, Lviv, Dnipro and other destinations, targeting aid to those who need it most. Times may be difficult at home, but in Ukraine there are people whose lives have been totally destroyed. This effort relies on your donations, so please give what you can, no matter how small, on the Just Giving page at this link. Every penny you give will go to helping sufferers from this cruel conflict rebuild their lives. The link for your donations is justgiving.com slash crowdfunding slash Ukraine Fundraiser 2022. That's justgiving.com 
slash crowdfunding slash Ukraine fundraiser 2022. One thing I've learned in this journey back and forth across the continent of Europe, looking up theorists associated with the places we pass, is just how much they all moved around, often through necessities of war or religious and racial persecution. When they travelled, they took their ideas with them, forming networks of knowledge and relationships that add up to a global community of scholarship, none more so than John Comenius, born in what is now the Czech Republic. For much of his career, he zigzagged around between Poland, Sweden, England, Hungary and the Netherlands, where he finally died. John Amos Comenius, 1592-1670, was a Czech philosopher, pedagogue and theologian who is considered the father of modern education. He served as the last Bishop of the Unity of the Brethren before becoming a religious refugee and one of the earliest champions of universal education, a concept eventually set forth in his book Didactica Magna. As an educator and theologian, he led schools and advised governments across Protestant Europe through the middle of the 17th century. I really love Comenius uh, for the following reasons. He brings all this together. This is a guy who was hounded across Europe because, of course, in the post-Reformation figure that Europe was on fire. You know, it was war was everywhere. The defenestration in Prague, uh, 30 years war and so on. But he is real, he's this real bridge between the Reformation and the Enlightenment for me. You know, a lover of the scientific re uh, revolution. And he brings in a very interesting, I think this really is almost Erasmus-like, a thing called pan-Sophism. The idea of universal wisdom, a universal syllabus for everyone on the planet, rich or poor. So what is this unified? It's very particular, this. It's, it's a unified system of education, but also a unified curriculum. While people like Comenius have worked to unify and bring communities together through knowledge, others persist in trying to tear them apart. The crisis in Ukraine, apart from providing supply-side shocks for the global economy, has also impacted European learn tech firms, many of which have come to rely on satellite units of workers in Eastern Europe and Russia, typically employed as developers or in IT. Many of these individuals have had to relocate or have lost their jobs, for some, the impact has been greater. I was honoured to speak to one such professional, a Ukrainian national now relocated to Germany. She contacted me following the release of the first podcast in this series and told me her story. It's a sad one. Kate Fitzgerald, Head of Fact. Tell us a bit about her. Fact Facts. Yulia Kovac is e-learning specialist at the Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Information Technology near Bonn in Germany. An experienced English teacher with a background in the professional training and coaching industry, she was born and grew up in Luhansk, Ukraine. When Luhansk was occupied in 2014, she and her family had just moved to the city of Ivano-Frankivsk in the west of Ukraine, where she met her husband, Viktor. Having done his year's national service fighting in the Donbass, Victor was recalled on full-scale invasion by Russia in 2022 and sadly died in the fierce fighting around Bakhmut. So, Yulia Kovac, it's great to have you on the podcast. Welcome to The Learning Hack. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Oh, you're welcome. First of all, can you tell us where you are right now and what the situation's like there, what the weather's like and so on? Um, well, at the moment, I live in Germany, in Bonn, yeah. and uh, with my two dogs. Um, yeah, and it's uh, yeah, pretty calm here. I have been here for over a year now. Yeah, I'm getting used to it. Yeah. Um, so you work at the Fraunhofer Research Institute of Applied Information Technology, am I pronouncing that right? As an e-learning yeah. specialist, and obviously this is a learning podcast. Um, can you tell us a bit about the, the organization and your role there? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, so the Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, it's like the organization of many institutes, over 70, as I know, and... Uh, they're all research institutes, and I work for one of those. 
which is called uh, Fraunhofer Pitt. And um, I've been there for a year, around a year now. And um, as an e-learning specialist, uh, my task is to compose uh, online courses for, for people to book and to study um, in cooperation with the subject matter experts. So basically people doing research and developing things and uh, when they're ready to share it with the public, then we come in and uh, work together and compose those courses and then people are able to book them and um, the subject matter experts, they also uh, provide some um, guidance during the courses, right? So they can, they have Q&A sessions with the participants and so on. And um, the course that I'm working on right now, why basically I was hired, that's um, also part of the Help Ukraine program. They thought that um, a lot of people would come to Europe or EU countries and um, and they would need a job, of course. And IT and technologies are pretty good developed in Ukraine, but nevertheless, they would need like a starting point or some kind of guidance into the job market. So this, um, this project is for those people, for data scientists or data managers um, that would want to get a job in Europe, right? And on the other hand is for the companies, this is the idea that we came up with is like the sponsoring concept where the companies could sponsor a participant or a few places in this uh, course and then they would <clears throat> just get the the, the working force you know, prepared potentially you know, for their their company working. Okay. So to backtrack, you were you were born and raised in Luhansk, uh, in the far east of Ukraine. Uh, in the Donbass region, people in the UK and in, in the US will have heard uh, heard these names, um, and we know what happened there in 2014. And and more more people will know about the, the full scale invasion. But tell us first of all, what was it like growing up in Luhansk? Um, it's an interesting question because now when I look back, you know, it's a bit different because when you grew up. We're, you are growing up somewhere. You just don't compare places, right? And it was just a typical, I guess, region of Ukraine. This was post-Soviet times. Um, the 90s, they were not easy, I guess, for all the cities or maybe even for all the countries, uh, post-Soviet countries, right? Um, but still, like, we get the opportunities to study. And I'm really thankful for that because... The education I got, uh, the pedagogical education, um, it was the Lugansk National University, and back then it was it was 2004 when I um, entered the, the university, and it was like in the top five universities of Ukraine, and wow. um, so it was a pretty good ranked university. And that's why yeah, your English and... is so good because you trained as an English teacher, yeah. Yes, yes, it was also part of the training. So basically, it's like pedagogical university and psychological department and the elementary school teacher and part of that was also English. Yeah. English I mean, you, you, you speak English very well. What was your first language? Was it Ukrainian or Russian? Because you are right on the border with Russia there. Yes, you? yeah, exactly. Well, um, we spoke Russian. And uh, most of people spoke Russian in the city. Um, but um, I never thought of Russian as my mother tongue somehow. So uh, I always knew Ukrainian and I always learned that it's cool and everyone learned that it's cool as a second language. Um, but um, if anyone would ask me what is your language, I would say Ukrainian, even though I spoke Russian mostly at that time. Yeah, how, how and, many languages uh, speak all together? Well, um, I speak, uh, well, Russian, I don't speak it anymore. I, it's yeah. like, um, <laughs> I cut it out <laughs> uh, of the knowledge, but 
I used to speak it, then Ukrainian, English, and German. And mm -hmm. I'm starting to learn Turkish. Um, it's just fun. Just for fun, yeah. yeah. Just for which fun, language, yes. which, which language do you think in? Oh, um, it depends, actually. It's all the time different languages, because um, since I'm here in Germany, I uh, hear so uh, much <laughs> German that uh, sometimes, or like every day is three language for me. It's every day Ukrainian, English, and German anyway, because um, the course, the work I'm doing is in English. And the colleagues uh, I'm talking to is in German. And uh, well, if I communicate with my friends or family, it's Ukrainian. So it's every time, every day, it's three language um, environment. So yeah. to say so, it's basically, you know, in the evening, I sometimes don't know exactly which language I'm thinking in. Uh, I mean, this is always a, a, an astonishing thing for British people because we don't tend not to speak any other languages. You know, I've got a bit of schoolboy French and some absolutely antiquated uh, schoolboy German, but not very much. And then we, we, when I came to Ukraine, it's you, you see people who were using three languages all the time and, you know, do that head switch between them. It's really interesting. So can you explain the circumstances under which you moved from Luhansk to the west of Ukraine? Was was that to do with sort of what was going on with the political situation or, or and, and when exactly did it happen? Um, you know, not, not really, because it happened earlier, a few years earlier, before yeah. the invasion or the war started. It was in 2007. And... Um, yeah, and I, it was 2014. I, yeah. For for you know, listeners who don't know so much about it, it's 2014 when uh, Russian incursions first started happening into into uh, that area of Ukraine. Yeah, so yeah. you've gone yeah. before then. What what was the before reason for moving? Um, it's um, it's it's pretty good question because I never know um, how to explain that. That's maybe luck or gut feeling. I really don't know because uh, nothing special happened or there was not like a particular reason for that but at that point my family uh, well they originated in the, the family comes from the western Ukraine and they just moved around um, a lot during the Soviet times because they kind of couldn't quit your job freely or choose where to work or where to live uh, basically you had to send a request to the authorities and say, I want to quit my job and I want to do this and this. And they would offer you a position and it could be anywhere in the country or even another Soviet country. So for example, yeah. my grandparents, they lived in Kazakhstan for a year and then they came back because they just wanted to go the way to Ukraine. Okay, and so they just moved around. That was in the lot. Soviet era where you, you didn't have that much choice. And then when the, the, the wall came down, um, gradually you began to have more freedom of movement so the family decided to move somewhere else yeah 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 exactly so you settled in ivano frankivsk i hope i'm saying that correctly it's which, a long a long name ivano frankivsk right? yeah which is not so far from lviv where um yeah. I, I i was although when i say that's like you know, 100 miles or whatever to the south and and you married victor uh, but on your first anniversary in 2014, when the Russian incursion started, he went to fight in Donetsk. Um, how did that come about? Did he enlist or did he, was he called up or did he have a military background? Um, yes, yes. Um, he was called up and he had to go. Yeah. Um, well, basically in Ukraine, you have this obligation as a man. When you turn 18, you should go uh, to the army, right? And do the service for one year. Yeah. And um, he did that when he was 20 or 21. So basically he had a little experience, like a trained, he was trained for that. But then again, like not everyone gets uh, called up when something actually happens, right? So he received this uh, note and he had to go and um, he was trained for a few months maybe, and then yes he was sent to Donbass region and what were your feelings about that at the time was it must have been a very nervous time it was it was really um, hard and uh, I, I I don't know I even don't know how I 
lead through that because uh, I would leave just uh, you know from call to call or from message to message because uh, usually the um, the connection is really poor and um, you could not uh, just call whenever you want. So basically, um, she could just send one message uh, per day, sometimes at night, at late night or you know early morning. Or he could call and we just talk for a few minutes, and it would just uh, interrupt it, and then uh, I would just wait for the, another call. Okay. So then after his military service was up, after 13 months, he was back and the two of you settled into civilian life for a while. So how was your career as a learning professional progressing at this time or where were you in your career? Yeah, I was working uh, for an online platform, which was providing English lessons, uh, one-on-one -on -one with tutors. And it was pretty innovative at that time. It was like 2000. 15 maybe or 16 and um, this platform they had like the lessons uh, integrated home task that, that would be checked automatically uh, which was pretty cool and saved a lot of time for the teachers I guess so my job was to explain how this works to just um, um, guide the new teachers into this platform and uh, the knowledge of this uh, school and so on, and also like uh, search for new teachers uh, inside and outside uh, Ukraine because um, it was uh, it was really a cool experience also because of the all the native speakers that I got to meet yeah, for this job and just uh, a lot of people from different places. Really cool. Yeah, and Victor was working as a, a designer. Is that right? Is he involved in learning or? Um, he was he was learning it yes exactly he wanted to become a 3D max uh, designer yeah and uh, so he was taking the also like uh, one on one lessons in the future and um, he was designing like a house uh, with all the uh, all the details and everything it was like a pretty cool project and uh, he enjoyed it a lot mm -hmm. learning the stuff because. Uh, I guess he, it was like his uh, his dream to, to be able to project. So you were making a life together. Now we come to the part of the interview that I understand might be difficult for you. It's quite difficult for me to ask the questions, but. Life changed completely, I'm guessing, with the full-scale Russian invasion in February 2022. Can you tell us what happened next? Yes. Um, the day um, he was going to fly to visit his sister, and early in the morning, around 5 a.m., he got the message that the, his flight was cancelled. And uh, at that time, we just knew that the war started and um he just said i i need to get my things and uh, prepare myself to go back to the army so um yeah uh, and during uh this first hours we heard also we heard explosions and um our airport was uh, bombed the very first day it was really scary. So um, he got uh, his things and uh, and he got to this uh, military district and they said that um, he has time till tomorrow. And they gave him one day to prepare. And the next day, 25th, uh, early in the morning, he should be there with all his stuff prepared. Um, it's kind of... Um, also extraordinary for me because the 26th was his birthday and we were planning stuff, right? So we were inviting friends to come over and so on. And then you know, he was back in the army just like that. Um, so he was gone and uh, I stayed alone at home and uh, with my two dogs and the cat. 
and um, it got really scary really fast because I was so confused. I didn't know um, what to do in this new situation, this life situation. And uh, all these um, air alarms, they got you know, just a uh, um, few, few times a day and night. And uh, you just don't know what to expect when, this, when you hear the sound. You know? mm-hmm. Because you understand that probably, yeah, you know, or not, like anything can be bombed anytime. And, yeah. um, pro- you know, like, um, and so I would just um, take the animals and all the, like, the survival backpack and everything and go down uh, the 10th floor <laughs> uh, yeah. and take the step, steps because you, you're not allowed to take elevator. You're in this tent, and uh, you would just go to the basement and wait. And uh, sometimes it were like a few hours that you stay there, uh, and then they would just say, uh, "Okay, it's safe to go home." And then you would go back, and then a few hours later, again and again, and uh, so it was really, really difficult. And uh, like in combination with my fears and thoughts. For my husband, because he was directed, you know, uh, somewhere at the front line, mm. and um, again the connection was really poor, and um, there were days that we, I didn't get any messages, and um, he said that um, like after the first week, probably um, when he was there fighting, and he said, you know, it's much more difficult and scary than it used to be. Like that in Donbass because yeah, of the in... sorry yeah, because sorry. of the plane, planes. Yeah. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. And he was the, the place where he was. He was in Bakhmut, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Well, he was in different uh, places actually. Yeah, he was uh, first sent to Kiev, and then um, when in Kiev the situation changed, then they were redirected. And yes, you know, the last few months. Um, he spent in the uh, Bakhmut region. And, uh, and then in November, he, he died here. Yeah. Let's take a moment. That's fine. You know, it's been. Nine months, but still, when it took about this. I can imagine. Well, I can't imagine, but how did you hear the news? Was it a phone call or a. Yes, they. I, mean, I was here in Germany and just a number called and were they asking me some questions about my husband or. Did I have anyone in the army or what was his name and my home address and stuff like that? And I couldn't understand why they were asking those things. Mm. And uh, I said, what happened? What do you want? Who is this? And they just said that usually we don't want to tell such news on the phone. Mm. But since you are abroad and there is no one at home at our apartment that we can contact. And as his wife, I'm like the first contact, of course. Then they say that you should come home. And uh, I asked why and what happened. And they say, because your husband died. That in a bottle. Very sorry for your loss. You know, people will be very moved to hear that and, and about the sacrifice you made. And I thought it was quite moving message you sent me before the interview. I, I just said, you really want to do this. And you said you wanted people to know exactly what the sacrifices are being made for Ukraine are. And I think 
you know, very grateful to you that you will speak to us and give us some idea of that. Thank you for letting me speak about that because as I came here um, to Europe, also like in Ukraine, people who have no connection to the army or they have no relatives in the army, they have a hard time to imagine what it's like. And uh, mm. people ask me questions like, why did you let him go? But basically, it was not my decision. And uh, when someone attacks you, you should protect yourself, right? And someone should do it. And he felt that he's the one who should do it. So I couldn't only support him in this decision. Of course, he didn't want to die. And he didn't want me to die. He didn't want any of Ukrainians to die. That's why he made the decision to go and protect everyone he could. It's a really tough decision. And uh, as you said, we lived through this experience once back in 2014 and that gave me some kind of hope or I don't know that everything's going to be okay and he will come back again. Mm. But, yeah, you know, we cannot control that. So how do you deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis? It's uh, just trying to survive every day. And trying to do something. Um, people around me are very supportive, and this is, I guess, what is helping me the most talking to people, telling the story, or just getting support from my colleagues and my friends at home, my family, because. Another question that people usually ask is, what can I do to help you? But nothing you can do, basically. It's just, just be there and, and listen. When someone wants to talk about such a story, yeah. don't be afraid to listen to it. Yeah. So to the extent that you can focus now on your working life, is it does it is it one of those things where work is a useful distraction or is it just that much tougher to kind of concentrate on it? You know, it's kind of both. It's, it's yeah. difficult to explain, but uh, when I think about work, I think, okay, I have these tasks that I need to do and I don't feel like I have the energy for it, you know? Yeah. And uh, everything seems so unimportant in the moment. But on the other hand, when I sit down and try to concentrate and uh, accomplish some of the tasks, I feel like I've done something and I've got through this day and I've achieved like a small step and it's better than nothing and uh, so in this sense I guess the job, the job really helps me to go further and uh, to also the thought that I might help someone with their life here as a refugee for example is also important for me and I think that okay uh, maybe this is my task now or the idea where I belong now is to help others if I can. So this is kind of thought that it makes me do. Maybe some people will be surprised about having suffered all that, become a refugee yourself. You throw yourself into 
helping others like yourself but you know maybe that also that makes sense for people that that you are helping refugees and uh, as a refugee yourself how do you feel that way do you feel a, that you're a refugee Did, what does it feel like to be displaced as well as having to deal with all that grief um i cannot really name myself a refugee i don't know why and uh, maybe i don't have these labels for me anyway because uh, people also ask me if i can view myself or name myself a widow and i also come i don't know who i am you know i'm here and so uh, that's my life story and this is who i am and what i do and i do what i can basically so i guess like technically i am a refugee but i don't feel like one mm. and what are your hopes for the future now Well, the main hope, I guess, all people, Ukrainian people have is the victory. You know, this is yeah. the main hope that we all pray um, for. It's like the sooner we win, the less people, the less families will be hurt. And this is like the main hope for me. For me personally, I don't know really because. There are no hopes or plans for the future. I don't know if I want to stay here or come back home. It's like I miss home, I miss my friends. But uh, on the other hand, I know that when I come home, it's no one there. My husband is not there. So it's like, then I think, okay, I can as well stay here because it's like, doesn't matter anymore. I don't know. There is no plan. That was going to be next. My next question: Do you, do you ever think you'll return to Ukraine permanently? But it it, it seems you're not not sure about that. Well, I I wish I could. I guess I wish that uh, after the war ends, that that I can there is the possibility for me to come home. Because I think that when it's not over yet, and uh, they talk all the time about escalations and uh, how things can get worse. So I guess the main thing that I hope for is there is a place for me to come home to when it's over. And my home is still there, my city is still there, my friends are still there. Mm. And uh, in this case, I would. I would want, of course, to go home. Uh, and when you say your city, what do you think of your as your city now? Is that um, not Luhansk, but necessarily, but um, uh, Ivano Frankivsk? Yes, I've, over the years, I've thought about Ivano Frankivsk as my home now, because I spent all those years happy years with my husband there and all the happy memories of course mm -hmm. but um, anyway it would be um, it would be amazing if I could go to Luhansk someday because at this point I guess all, all, all these years right now it was so difficult to imagine that I can come back there but I would really want to and you still have family there in Ivano Frankis. Well, um, I have my husband's family okay. you know, like there, but uh, my own family is also here in Germany. So basically. Oh, okay. Entirely yeah, as a family on my side. and the dogs. Yes. Um, but I know what comfort dogs can be, even though it it, it it seems kind of paltry to say that in these circumstances. Lastly, Yuli, I, I don't think I should detain you anymore because I, I just feel this has been very difficult, painful for you. 
and we're very thankful that you've taken the time and put yourself through this. But what message would you give to people, um, perhaps in the learning community, but you know, perhaps whatever wider community uh, we're talking to now um, about what's happening in Ukraine and and how they can help? And I, I could also should also say that you're going to be speaking at Online Educa Berlin, aren't you? In yeah. This year. So people yes, can come and see that. Uh, but but what message would you give to to people of the the, the West or the Wester? Um, I would first of all uh, thank all the the people that uh, support me or supported me and all the Ukrainians because uh, it was really amazing how people opened literally opened their homes and uh, took people in, people they never met, uh, you know, or they don't even speak the same language and uh, and help them survive. It, it's really amazing impact for all the Ukrainians. And um, I would probably want to say that please don't be afraid to learn more about this and to, to talk to people, to ask people what they are living through because um, you come here, you come to a safe place, but it doesn't mean that your challenges finish at this point. It's only the start for a lot of people, the language or the job or whatever. And uh, just be there for those people, ask them what they need or just listen to their stories because uh, it's really... Uh, incredible um, what people are doing how and how what people are doing to survive it's also incredible we are trying to survive as a nation well thank you for taking the time to get that message across today and those of us who are going to berlin in november look forward to to seeing you there in the flesh and you know maybe having a glass of wine together um I'm really thankful that you've you've agreed to do this today, Yulia. And um, it's been obviously a difficult conversation, but a, a, a very good one in, in many ways. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Talking to Yulia brought home to me the price that the people of Ukraine are paying to defend their independence more vividly even than the casualty numbers climbing rapidly as I speak. Her story tells us something about the reality of war, which starts with impressive-sounding speeches full of big abstract nouns and ends in blunted life choices, missing limbs, families torn apart, homes, towns and villages obliterated. It would be doing a disservice to the memory of Victor if I made a glib link now to the last of our thinkers in Theorist Corner, Eric Kandel, but there are resonances... Kandel's father was from the region of Ukraine Andy and I have just visited, Lviv Oblast. His mother was from an Ashkenazi Jewish family living near Ivano-Frankivsk, where Julia and Viktor made their home. Ukraine had a sizable Jewish population at one time, largely wiped out in the Holocaust. Kandel's parents moved to Vienna on the outbreak of the First World War, which is where they met and where Eric was born. In 1938, Austria was annexed by Nazi Germany and the family migrated to America, which is where Eric Kandel made his mark. Eric Richard Kandel, born 1929, is an Austrian-born American medical doctor specialising in psychiatry, a neuroscientist and a professor of biochemistry and biophysics at Columbia University. He received the 2000 Nobel Prize for his research on the physiological basis of memory storage in neurons. His work, which included experiments with giant sea slugs, centred on an explanation of the relationships between psychology and neurology and has been foundational in the development of AI learning. Donald Clark explains why. His finding here is that long, that sort of long-term storage, what we call long-term memory, involves gene activation. The creation of a, so there's new proteins and new syn, uh, uh, synaptic connections. He actually discovers this in the lab. 
he finds that memories are actually changes or the creation of new proteins and synaptic connections. Now, that second half is really important here because when we come to Hebb and all these other people, they pick up on this idea. And um, it was already known in a sense by the time uh, Candle comes along here, but they, they pick up on that idea. But it's foundational here that Candle finds this link between experience of the world and biology and the neural and the neural structure of the brain. Learning can now be seen as experience captured a cellular change. And he does that. You know, he, he, he discovers that. That may seem trivial, but nobody had come up with this before. Nobody had actually found out mm -hmm. how memories were actually being stored in the brain. And then he goes on to look at the plasticity of a brain, how it might change in many ways, okay, with molecular modifications. It's quite clear to me that the brain is a material object uh, and that there has to be, um, we now know that it's a mixture of synaptic communications, a mixture of the chemical communications and the physical or the electrical communications across the brain in terms of consolidation and reconsolidation of memories. Good morning, everybody. This is a final update from Run 19. Would you believe it? Um, John and I have had a very brief <laughs> visit to Lviv. Fairly routine in many respects, but absolutely vital, important work. So we're on the ferry back now. A few thank yous to say, first of all, um, to Oksana, um, and the team, uh, the uh, the wheelchairs and all the aid you put on board was very gratefully received at Lviv Hospital. Um, also, all the, the other boxes that went down to Oksana as well, they've all gone. So huge thanks to you. Big thanks to Bob and Dan up in Loughborough. Uh, your PPE equipment, also some of that came over uh, on this trip as well, and that's gone to Lviv Hospital as well. Um, Finally, to uh, the Brass Band Aid project, and in particular, Gens 2 and 3, or 3 and 4, for the wonderful collection of uh, crutches that are also now at the Lviv uh, Hospital. Um, absolutely super. Um, thanks to those who've donated. John has done an excellent job. We've been talking a lot about things not, not really related to the trip, per se. So, to do with our day jobs, but he has been doing a full Bob Geldorf on all his mates. <laughs> so we've, he's managed to raise some much needed funds towards the costs. And a huge thanks to our other big donor. Not sure whether you want your name mentioned, so I won't for the moment, but thank you. I know your, your contribution is also exceptionally well received by us. It makes a huge difference. So that's a wrap from Run 19. Um, Next up, Run 20, you watch this space because this is going to be a big one with both fans going out and going somewhere very special. Um, watch out for that one. So it's goodbye from me and goodbye from me. I was a bit shocked when I saw the video where Andy records that final message. We both look completely fucked. I'm in awe of the resilience and commitment shown by Andy and his team and what they all personally contribute. Depending on when you're listening to these words, it's probable that the next run is already underway. They're taking two vans and a trailer this time with a payload of two and a half tonnes. They'll be visiting Kiev, Dnipro and Zaporizhia, where, as Andy says, with characteristic understatement, it's a bit lively right now. They'll also collect a couple of people to be evacuated back to the UK. In a way, I wish I was with them. In another way, I know that the most useful thing I can do as a non-driver is to sit here banging out podcast episodes about what they're doing in my very comfortable hack shack. You've been listening to Hacking Ukraine, a multi-episode special from The Learning Hack. The series is written and produced by John Helmer with help from me, Kate Fitzgerald. All original music is by John Helmer. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Area 9 Lyceum, Andy Wooler and All at Ukraine Fundraiser 2022, as well as Uckfield Concert Brass. Andy would like to thank everybody who's donated. Please keep those donations rolling in. And I'd like to thank Andy for use of the music we play behind our pleas for fundraising. It's Andy's own orchestral arrangement of Plyva Katcha, a traditional Ukrainian folk song about war performed by the London Shostakovich Orchestra. If you should happen to belong to an orchestra, Andy says you're free to use it. 
His only request being that you hold a collection for one of the organizations supporting Ukraine. It doesn't have to be Ukraine Fundraiser 2022, although that would be nice. Since Ukraine Fundraiser 2022 formed at the start of the Russian invasion, the organisation has made more than 18 runs to Kyiv, the Donetsk region, Zaporizhia, Lviv, Dnipro and other destinations, targeting aid to those who need it most. Times may be difficult at home, but in Ukraine there are people whose lives have been totally destroyed. This effort relies on your donations, so please give what you can, no matter how small, on the Just Giving page at this link. Every penny you give will go to helping sufferers from this cruel conflict rebuild their lives. The link for your donations is justgiving.com slash crowdfunding slash Ukraine Fundraiser 2022. That's justgiving.com slash crowdfunding slash Ukraine Fundraiser 2022.